Welcome. Thank you for Three, coming. Six. Um, I'm Maria Jose Jimenez. I'm Venezuelan Canadian. I'm a poet and translator. I live in Massachusetts. And I straddle the border between the US and Canada. Um, I'm a member of both ALTA and LTAC, which is uh, the Canadian sister organization, uh, Literary Translators Association of Canada, and Association des Traducteurs et Traductrices Littéraires du Canada. <laughs> a mouthful. <laughs> uh, so we'll call it LTAC today. Um, this event is part of a pilot um, partnership between ALTA and LTAC to promote uh, collaboration between the two organizations and increase the number of Canadian participants as well as continue a history of collaboration between the two organizations. Um, we'll also have a bilingual reading tomorrow afternoon at uh, 2.15. Uh, most of us will be there and most of us are uh, also LTAC members. Um, we will try to focus on a few areas. Uh, the status of literary translator, uh, translation in Canada from a few different perspectives, the effect of the emphasis of the two official languages, English and French, on what gets published and uh, what kind of funding is available to translators, uh, and leading into that, the institutionalized support uh, of translation in Canada, which is a very s different scenario than in the United, United States, and we'll try to touch a little bit upon um, cross-border traffic in terms of what, uh, in the publishing world, but also as translators of non-official languages, uh, collaboration with other countries or being published in other countries. Uh, just a little bit of context. Um, well, I will introduce participants first. Could you speak up a tiny bit? Thank you. Not Thank you. There's a bit yeah, of a, a high ceiling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Hugh Hazelton is a writer, poet, and translator based in Montreal. He translates poetry and prose from French, Spanish, and Portuguese into English. He uh, won the Governor General's Award in 2005 for a translated collection of poems by Joël de Rossier. Uh, he's a professor emer emeritus of Spanish at Concordia University in Montreal. And he's a past co-director of uh, the Banff Literary, uh, International Literary Translation Center. Stephen Hennigan is a translator writer, journalist, and literature professor. He's the author of four novels, uh, three, short, three short story collections, and six works of nonfiction or academic criticism. He's translated one novel from Romanian and is working on his third novel, novel length translation from Portuguese. He's also the editor of uh, Bilius's international translation series. Uh, Lida Nosrati translates between English and Farsi. Her translations have appeared in print and online journals. She's published several translations, uh, translated volumes in Iran, uh, so from English into Farsi. And she's been awarded fellowships from the BAM Center for the Arts, Yado, and Santa Fe Art Institute. Then Phyllis Aronoff is a very prolific translator from English, between English and French. Uh, she translates Quebecois and French fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Um, her trust translations have won awards and been shortlisted for uh, prizes, including the Governor General's Award. And she served two terms as president of, the, of LTAC. Um, and finally, Howard Scott, who's also a very prolific translator from French to English. Uh, he translates fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, and often with uh, those. And he won the Governor, General Award, Governor General's Award in 1997. And he's also past president of LTAC. Uh, just a little bit of context, context for those of you who don't know uh, LTAC. Uh, it was founded in 1975. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary in Montreal uh, last month. And it was created uh, to support literary translation in Canada, uh, across all of Canada. Um, it, it, in terms of how it compares to ALTA, it combines the work of ALTA and the Pen Translation Committee in terms of connecting translators and uh, also advocating for translators, uh, copyrights issues, providing a model contract for translators to use, um, and things like that. There's a lot of information on our website if you'd like to find out more. But I would like to highlight just a couple of our achievements. One is co-founding uh, BILTSI, the Banff International Literary Translation Center, um, obtaining public lending rights 
uh, payments for translators on an equal basis with authors. Uh, we also present the John Glasgow Translation Award every year uh, to the best translator, uh, the first book length translation. And many of, of the activities of LTAC include um, uh, organizing readings conferences, participating in international, national and international literary festivals, uh, and supporting other organizations to publish um, translation uh, journals, such as Translit, uh, which is a collaboration with the Association of Translators and Interpreters of Wales Berta. Um, the name of this round table, the Great Canadian Roundabout, came from a conversation with Madeline Stratford, who's the president of LTAC. Uh, she was talking about how translation in Canada seems to be sometimes limited and sort of stuck going around the circle uh, because of the emphasis of English and French. Um, and I like the analogy because it is true that there's a lot of limitations, but roundabouts also have a lot of openings and you can go in different directions. And the in my brief uh, period of membership of El in LTAC, I've noticed that there's growing uh, opportunities and more support for uh, non-official languages, translations, translators who work from non-official languages and into non-official languages. Um, so I would like to ask um, perhaps Howard or Phyllis to um, speak a little bit about uh, the institutionalized support of translation. Uh, there are a lot of uh, collaborations between LTAC and other organizations, but if we could maybe focus on uh, Canada Council for the Arts, the international and the domestic translation program, which is very different right. than what happens in the well, States. Yeah, the, Can the Canada Council uh, gives grants for uh, translations, translations of, of Canadian authors. So uh, between as usually between English and French domestically, and they also they also have subs international the international uh, translation program for for people translating Canadian authors into other languages, and uh, and well, some people often assume that it's only English <coughs> English and French, but actually it's if as long if you're a Canadian author, I think you have to be published in in Canada. <coughs> so it could be in Danish. And one example I know is, is is Danish. That's eligible for the uh, for the Canada Council grants also <coughs> as a translation from Danish. And for and any for language Lynn. that's been, yeah. uh, in which a book in Canada has been published, Spanish. Uh, you've done Spanish, right, Hugh? Yeah, <coughs> as long as the for third languages, it's uh, as long as the. The writer and the translator are both either citizens of Canada or permanent <coughs> residents of Canada. Mm -hmm. And is and also <laughs> translations into into Aboriginal languages are eligible, but it doesn't happen very <laughs> well. Metatiok uh, Napolok, the the Inuit writer who was translated from Inuktitut first into French yeah, yeah. about ten years ago and then yeah. into English a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah, but uh, I mean, none of this happens very much. Ninety-eight percent of the traffic, ninety-nine percent of the traffic is French, English, English, French. Yes. The others are are very rare exceptions. And could could you speak also about the international program because there is also funding for translations into um, other in other languages, not English or French, uh, from English. It, they have to have been from English or French, but there is funding. Uh, in, within the international program as well, and perhaps yeah, the, uh, for translation into huh? sure. Yeah, um, sorry, I did I cut you off. No, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to mention something about the uh, uh, the, the international grant, which is a wonderful thing to exist, but um, it kind of makes uh, things complicated when you are. Um, thinking uh, things in the context of a country like Iran. Uh, because I, um, I have been involved in translating a novel by a Canadian author. And uh, when I met with my publisher in Iran, and uh, I told him about the existence of this international grant. Um, but in fact, uh, it's, um, 
it's complex in the sense that the, the, of the bureaucratic uh, hurdles that exist, but and because of the sanctions uh, and all that. Uh, but um, so so that's one part of it. that's the bureaucratic element of it. But also, um, given that almost everything in Iran gets politicized, uh, and the fact that you have to acknowledge the receipt of this grant on the uh, on the copyright uh, page uh, may uh, compl complicate things even further to the extent <coughs> of putting the publisher and the translator. Uh, on the spotlight in not, not a very favorable or pleasant way. So uh, what happens at the end of the day that you as a translator and the publisher, uh, in spite of the existence of this wonderful grant, choose not to take advantage of it because of the repercussions it might have? In, in Iran. In Iran, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've, I've kind of noticed it in, in Spanish anyway. Uh, now, I don't know exactly why, but um, a lot of the authors who, whose books have received the, the funding, which is, I think, for 50% of the cost of the translation, um, say a, a Spanish publisher wants to publish a, a book by a Canadian author, and the uh, Canada Council will pay 50% of the pri price of the translation. But somehow they seem to go to m the most established authors. I don't know whether this has to do with the, you know, the the possible sales, uh, you know, of the book or or what, but uh, you know, Margaret Atwood and Andachi, you know, you, you kind of seen the same names there, and, and um, we looked into Mexican publishers, and they, it doesn't seem to be nearly as used in in Mexico as it does in Spain, where they have the larger publishing houses. So, I don't know how how that works, but there, it, there seems to be a slight imbalance towards more established uh, writers, but. A lot of countries now have uh, have funding for uh, the the translation of of their own authors into um, other languages in other countries, in, including uh, Brazil and Argentina. Also uh, have funds available for that now, as and, well as European and, countries and Colombia now. And Colombia just Great. added it. Great. Yeah, not a lot, but it's it's available. Right. Yeah, France, Belgium. Well, uh, the European, the Western <coughs> yeah. European ones have done it yeah. for years. Yeah, it's yeah. the the novelty is that it's now happening yeah. in yeah. in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you speaking well, to me? Yeah, Howard. Well, I was just going to say what, what you, you, you mentioned. They give, they give, the Canada Council pays 50% uh, of the going rate of the, of the, uh, the country where the, the, the translation is being published. Whereas in domestically, it's 100% it's of, well, it's 100%, well, they, they, have a, they have a set rate. And then uh, they go to the translator or to the publisher? It goes to the translator through the, the, the publisher. Trans Sometimes end up in the hands of the translator, actually. <laughs> that, yes, well, that's another question. Can sometimes, that is, <laughs> yes. sometimes it can take a while. Usually. A very good point. <laughs> it should end up in the hands of the translator. Uh, but uh, going back to the domestic um, translation program, because it's, I think it's important to highlight that it, things work very differently in, in Canada than the United States, where the publisher in the, in the States pays out of pocket, usually, or sometimes through small uh, funding program, programs. But in Canada, through the Canada Council Publishing Grant, publishers are uh, funded directly. They can apply for a, a translation grant from Canada Council to pay the translator directly. And there's, they set the standard rate, uh, which right now I think is 18 cents per word for prose. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah and more, uh, a little more for poetry. So it, in a way, uh, the, the, the institutionalized support changes the game um, compared to how things work here in the States. Yeah, and they pay the, they pay the, the publishing costs, too, of the, of the book. I mean, the printing, as long as you print in Canada. As long as you, as long as you print in Canada, yeah. you know. But so, and, and in a sense, I mean, um, I think the, the Canadian government, I mean, even in the last, uh, Super austerity uh, regime that we had. Uh, you know, the the Canada Council funding for wasn't actually. You know, it was nibbled at, but it wasn't a cut for that because there's a there's a consensus that in order for Canadian publishing to to survive, that it, you know it has to have government support, and which is interesting because um, 
you can see that in Quebec, but you know, Quebec has it in common with Latin American countries and European countries that state intervention to support the arts. But in, in English Canada too, you know, in the English speaking world, it's it's uh, you know, that's it's rare to see that. But that's taken by and large to be deemed necessary. Uh, I I, think, sorry, go ahead, Phyllis. Sorry. I was just gonna say that it uh, the part of the reason for the funding of uh, of translation between French and English in Canada is is because is not because of their huge respect for the art form yeah. of translation, unfortunately. It's simply because it's part of the package of, of support for bilingualism. We're officially a bilingual country. It, and, and so the, the, there's definitely an upside to that, which means that uh, uh, you know, it enables uh, tra translation and publishing of, uh, of books uh, between basically mostly between the two official languages. The downside is that that the translators are sort of, I don't know, considered uh, or as sort of as technicians of bilingualism or something like that. And we're, uh, you, unlike other programs of the Canada Council for the Arts, we're, um, I wouldn't say that we're really considered artists. Uh, so that's a kind of a, that's, that's kind that's, of one. That's why you get treated better. <laughs> I, want to, I want to be an artist and I want to starve. <laughs> yeah. it's a, I, I, would, I would go one step farther than Phyllis. I would say it's not even seen as a, an arts funding issue. It's seen as a national unity issue. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's not really a... It, it, it continues to be funded because it is not really seen as being part of the artistic realm. It's, it's part of keeping the country together. But it is funded through an arts funding it, it body, is, yeah, so you yeah, can but, kind of yeah. but it's a lot easier cling to, get to that idea. Yeah, it's, 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 you can get the grant almost automatically, whereas yeah. mm -hmm. uh, any other arts funding is extremely competitive mm -hmm. and extremely mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. to get. In, but in, what, in, one nice thing when we went to to the Banff uh, International uh, Literary Translation Center was we were issued a card that said artist. artist. <laughs> 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 No, I would like to quote uh, Sherry Simon, who m made a comment at our uh, during the, the 40th anniversary celebration last month. Um, the John Glasgow Prize for translation was presented, uh, but at the beginning um, of the of the celebration, she made, she she spoke as did other uh, well-known translators, um, and she said in French. Uh, so I will paraphrase uh, something like. Um, like the, it is true that uh, translators have benefited from the institutionalized support of uh, translation by organizations like Canada Council, but at the same time, uh, literary translators are cornered uh, in a way and, and at the mercy of uh, not just the availability of funding, but um, the language politics. Uh, and I think that speaks to what you're, uh, you're just mentioning. Um, so I don't know, did anyone have any more comments about uh, well, I that think, dichotomy? I think we need to go one step beyond just reciting what the policies are and start talking about some of the psychological and, and uh, aesthetic impact of, the, of this is. And that is that while it has promoted a lot of translations between English and French, it has also led to a relative indifference on the part of the reading public towards these translations, which are seen as products of government uh, policy rather than as exciting works you might discover and actually want to read. Uh, so you, you cannot lose money on translating a book from English to French or French to English, and whereas you can lose money on any other book you publish. And one of the consequences of that, I think, has been that they don't always get promoted very well and they tend to just be seen as a, a sort of worthy thing you have to do. It's a bit like giving you know, $10 to the Christmas seals or something. And the, because of that, a lot of the books don't sell very well. And in fact, it needs to be said that uh, a lot of even very well-known authors in one language are often unknown in the other language. Uh, English Canadian authors tend to be known in Quebec if they are big enough to be translated in Paris. If they're translated in Quebec, most Quebec readers will ignore them and not read the book. Uh, if, and uh, most Quebec novelists are not well known in Canada 
and in English Canada. And the, I mean, an example of that, one of the big bestsellers in Quebec, uh, Yves Beauchemin, whose first novel, Le Matou, uh, sold over a million copies worldwide. When he started, he wrote a four novel series about Quebec from the 50s to the 70s. And McClellan and Stewart, a very large Toronto publisher, bought the rights to it. They published the first two volumes in hardcover. The third volume came out as a soft cover, and the fourth volume was cancelled. And so the, the, the indifference is, is pretty clanging. Um, uh, they, uh, yes, go ahead. Excuse me, but they weren't great. He's n- no, he's not great literature, but he, <laughs> I'm sorry, he's I just very had to popular. Say that. Though. No, but yeah, he, he is yeah, a highly yeah, popular yeah. writer, and he's somebody who, you know, they're sentimental and they're they're not very well written. But he's the kind of writer who you would expect to have an audience, while the rest of us sneer that he's not a great artist. <laughs> well, I and and, exactly he, and even sneered. he's even he's getting cancelled, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and as so, somebody who did well internationally. And he, he's done very well internationally. Yeah, I mean, his first novel sold a million copies in, uh, I don't know, 15 or 20 countries. So the, uh, so that, I mean, that kind of consequence seems to me important. And another kind of consequence of which, personally, I've become very aware and tried in a modest way with some other people to try and remedy is the fact that because translation in Canada has become defined as French, English, English, French doing good works to keep the country together, uh, we have less publish in-country publishing of international translations than we ought to have. And that's, of course, I mean, I'm as I'm editor of the only literary series in Canada that defines itself as publishing international translations. There are a couple of other publishers who have brought out international translations a few times. Uh, Anansi has done a few, and a small, very small press called Exile, which doesn't bother to distribute its books, has done a few. Um, but the, um, so I think one thing we do need to talk about is how and why International, the public in in country publishing of international titles has been snuffed out, and I'd be happy to go on for a long time about that. But I think I've been I've talk, been talking a lot, so let somebody else do it. I, I <laughs> comment on that because um, um, part of uh, what um, Sherry Summit mentioned that that same night is how she sees uh, Alta being more worldly because members are supported in translating into and out of many languages, not, not just a few uh, or two, as in the case of LTAC, but your role, I think, in, uh, in the International Translation Series, I mean, you, you, tra- you published titles from Romanian, from, from we Portuguese. Have, we have published titles Spanish. from Polish, uh, Portuguese from both Angola and Mozambique, uh, Spanish from El Salvador, Spanish from Argentina. Um, and I'm forgetting. But anyway, various others. Can yes. Please? Sorry? No, and, and we're about to do Catalan. I will not, I shouldn't, I cannot forget this with our funders sitting in the audience. Are these translations that you buy from other... Okay, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting <laughs> subject. <laughs> okay, so one much bigger effect of arts funding in Canada, which I strongly support because I think that as a small market next to an enormous market, we would have no art at all if we didn't have government funding. So I mean, I'm, I'm not coming at this from an angle of saying we shouldn't have it, but it does have consequences. And one of the consequences is that the publishers assume that books are published with grants for, you get a grant for the author if the author is Canadian. You get a grant for the printing if you print in Canada. So the, uh, the I mean, the publisher has to deal with his or her own overhead, which is employees, renting office space, and stuff. But aside from that, a lot of the expenses are covered. So if you lose money, it's it's mainly I don't know. You, some people would say it's pretty hard to lose money. Although some people, a lot of publishers do manage to do it. Of course, publishers <laughs> tend to be good at that. But the um, the, but the result is it looks horrendous when you could begin to consider the prospect of publishing an international title because what happens? For, you don't get a grant for the author because the author is not Canadian. You don't get a grant for the translator because the translator is not. I mean, if the translator is Canadian, you get some sort. It's, it's a little better than if the translator isn't Canadian. But you're still, um, you can save a little money. You don't get any money for printing costs. 
you can then you can print outside the country and may, and that's cheaper than printing in Canada. Uh, so that's what we do. Um, but then there's the whole issue of buying rights, and you have the you know, with some of the books we've done, they've already come out in five or six other languages, and they're not out in English. And we go to the author's agent in Frankfurt, who says, "Oh well, English. Now we're going to get fifty thousand dollars." And we say, "We're a small literary press," <laughs> and so on. But there, you've got three uh, three layers of expense that are not there with domestic translations. And that, since most Canadian publishers are conditioned to working within the domestic conditions, that's enough to scare them off from doing international translations. And that's why we're the only ones crazy enough to do it. Uh, well, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I thought this would stir things up a little bit. I want to say something. About, first of all, on the French side. Yes, yeah. exactly. Because the, it's very odd in Canada. There's that somebody might be dreaming of you know having one national literature. I'm not sure it's a great idea. But uh, there, there are really... Uh, French publishing and English language publishing are are totally separate, and sometimes yes. rights are exchanged where at Frankfurt. Um, at any rate, our, on the French side, there has been really a lot of, of publishing uh, of translations, mainly of poetry, but really a lot. And the publishers are are uh, very cleverly taking advantage of, of the of the grants that come from the the uh, uh, source language countries. Uh, of that poetry, so that's one thing. Um, I, I just wanted to point that out. It's a, it's, it's a, yeah. it's a big difference. That's a, that's a, that's a big thing. Be, what, sorry. I wanted to know if you could clarify when you talk about Stephen a grant for the author, is that to cover the, the purchase of the rights, or is that the advance for the author, or what's the? Uh, it's often promotion. Anytime we publish, any time we publish a Quebec author, we get fifteen hundred dollars to bring him to Ontario. Okay, so it's a promotional grant. You're talking yeah. About uh, yeah, okay. but I mean, it is it is true that uh, because uh, translation has, has been seen as part of you know kind of trying to found a kind of a a Canadian identity in a bilingual way um, that you know it has been uh, limited to uh, more of a domestic access you know between English and French, French and English, and even translation programs which in in Canada were Canada was quite quick to establish uh, translation programs in universities. And but they were almost always English, French, French, English. Now there's a there's a growing consensus that you know it's time to move beyond that. And even the Canada Council, uh, you know, they don't like saying too much about it because obviously they can't. You know, they're not maybe going to put up the funds. But on the French side, it's really been astonishing how Les Écrits des Forges, yeah. as they have, I think 120 bilingual uh, or translated uh, books of poetry between French and Spanish, um, at least 70 of them in Mexico. And what they do is they, they uh, team up with a, a Mexican publisher, and then they co-publish the book. They've worked a lot with Mantis in Guadalajara. And so uh, over the last, say, 15 years, they've uh, kept this, uh, the ball rolling in this. And now they've, they've reached really like 120, 130 books. They've also uh, co-published books with uh, um, publishers in, in Europe. And it's to the point where uh, Gaston Belmar, who was uh, uh, one of the founders, and uh, I remember seeing him in, in Guadalajara at the book fair, and he had his own kiosk, and everybody knew him. Everybody would go by his uh, <laughs> table and, hey, hola, Gaston, como estas? And, you know, he speaks Spanish and everything. And, and you know, if you if you take these seventy or, or maybe more uh, books just in Mexico, that a Crédit Forge has has published and you know and they've paid the translation and so on of Quebec authors into Spanish and Mexican authors into into French, um, that has left a big imprint. If you talk to people in in Mexican, uh, uh, we're interested in Mexican poetry. I mean, it, in Mexico City, they say, yeah, you know, everybody, come, you know, the first thing they say is Les Écrits des And uh, as we know, there was also uh, Brigitte Bouchard who had Les Allusifs, mm -hmm. who, in order to get around it, she, she had offices in Europe and in Quebec, and she went back and forth, and she promoted the, the, the books that she translated. She, she published almost 
exclusively translations, didn't she? Yeah. Uh, quite a lot, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost yeah. exclusively, not. Yeah, not entirely, but almost, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she kept this, this uh, balance going between uh, Europe and, and Quebec. In the end, she, she sold the business to Lemayac, but Lemayac itself, a much larger publisher in Quebec, has a lot of, has a lot of translations on its, on its uh, roster. So, yeah, Actu Sud. Yeah, Actu Sud. Actu Sud is in yeah. both. Yeah, I'll, but the, it's true that the uh, and and there are more and more. Uh, uh, Wolsack and Win and there. You know, no, Wolsack and Win has done some poetry. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So uh, there it's, are uh, there are more uh, English uh, uh, publishers coming, uh, you know, online with this this thing of publishing translations from abroad, but the French side has really moved ahead much, much faster and much more completely. And, and especially and in poetry. Mark, left in, a real yeah. mark in, theater in Latin as well, America. That there's a lot more exchange between uh, Quebec theater and Mexican theater yeah. than between Excuse English and French Excuse me, I have to step up theater. for a minute. I'll be right back. Sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I just say one thing about the theater thing? And that's because... Um, Seyad, which is a, a Quebec theater um, kind of an association of Quebec playwrights and so on, along with, with other uh, Quebec cultural agencies and sometimes arms of the Quebec government, has kind of targeted Latin America because they saw Latin America as uh, they could kind of go over the, the great Anglophone, you know, massive people in the rest of Canada and, and the US and connect with Latin America and reinforce that connection of, you know, kind of the, the you know, Latinité du Nord and, the, you know, with the Latin Americans of, of the South. And so that's been something that they've, they started doing in the 70s and, they, and yeah. they've, they've, kept, they've kept doing it. And now there, there is a heck of a lot of Quebec theater that's translated into Spanish and uh, presented, especially in Mexico City, um, <coughs> in Spanish. So that's also been an important element. Did you have a comment, uh, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, this, this is all, all quite interesting, but it is very, very different from English Canada. Yes. Um, and it's worth mentioning that. It's also, I mean, and it's also worth mentioning that it is anchored in certain cultural assumptions in Quebec that are not made in, in English Canada. The, I mean, for example, Spanish is widely studied in, in Quebec, in the junior colleges and in the universities. In English Canada, since we signed the free trade agreement with the states, three major universities have closed their Spanish departments and another three are about to. So uh, Spanish is a, about as relevant as, as Dutch in, in English Canada. But uh, so but, it's uh, the good news, Stephen, yes. is that Glendon uh, just started the back. They they did have a certificate program in Spanish, but they, no, they have a bachelor's. I, kn I know they do, but Glendon is a very peculiar and special environment, and it's mainly French, which is one reason they do that. Uh, <laughs> Glendon is a is a French speaking un uh, college of York University. It's in English Canada, but a lot of the people who go there are from Quebec, which I think is one reason they're able to do this. The yeah. Is there in terms of the English language publishing, are you also competing, I mean, the Canadian public who want to buy works in translation into English, just go online and buy them from U.S. publishers? Um, well, they would, I guess they might buy them from Amazon. Uh, the, there, technically, there needs to be a Canadian distributor if they're to buy them in their local bookstore. Uh, some, um, but most Canadian publishers, in fact, some Canadian, some of the larger Canadian publishers, make a lot of their money by acting as Canadian distributors for a panoply of of U.S. publishers. So that's usually how that would work. Um, the uh, yeah yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you want to continue uh, on well, the, in this vein? I wanted to um, connect, because we're talking about Spanish, I wanted to connect to another exception to the English-French yeah. axis um, and maybe talk a little bit about Bilti because it's uh, a unique... A what? Uh, the Banff International Literary oh, Translation okay. yeah, Center. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I should explain. I am not a member of LTAC. I have never been to Banff. I know nothing about the institute. Insti I run this series, but I know yeah, nothing. I, I know nothing. I, 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 and I am a translator, but I, I know nothing about the, the, inst the institution. <laughs> 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 okay, I've never heard. I've never heard that before. Yeah, okay, um, but perhaps he, uh, since you are a former co-director, um, 
if you'd like to speak a little bit about built seats because it's, it, it's, it has a unique role, not just within Canada as because it includes all three official languages of North America, but also in terms of how different it is from most translation residency programs uh, in its emphasis, linguistic emphasis. Yeah, Bil Bilsi was uh, founded by uh, a group of people, uh, including uh, Linda Gaborio and uh, Susan Orio, who's a translator in, in Calgary, uh, at Banff, uh, because Banff, the Banff Center for the Arts has I don't know how many programs, uh, residency programs in all different aspects of the arts, probably 70, 80, uh, maybe even close to 100, and dance, music, all sorts of things. Literary, in literary arts, they have 10 programs. So they, they had some translation going on in theater. Linda Gaborio is the, probably the person who's translated most Quebec plays into English. And, um, it's, uh, but they wanted to see if they could get something broader going. And so it was established by Mexico, Canada, and the US. So it's a trilingual program, fully trilingual. Everything uh, uh, in the roundtable discussions and so on uh, is accessible in the three languages. And um, it's, they have um, 15 spots for professional translators. The residency program is it's all paid by the Banff Center. Um, and they have three spots for student translators, one from Mexico, one from the US, one from Canada. And uh, people come from all over the world uh, put in for this uh, program. Uh, the thing is that they have to, um, one of the languages that they translate into or out of has to be uh, English, French, or Spanish. But apart from that, it can be any language in or out of those languages. Um, so over the years, it's really gained a lot of momentum, and um, uh, in the past few years, we've received between 70 and 80 um, uh, requests to, to, uh, for the program per, per year. Um, the student program is quite competitive because there's only one student per country. And out of that uh, 70 or 80, we, we accept 15. So the translator has to have a project has to have a, pretty much has to have a publisher lined up. Uh, in certain cases, it doesn't have to. When, when, we, when we, we have a selection committee with two people from each country, two Mexicans, two Canadians, two Americans on it. And um, we try to, to take, a, to accept a certain, uh, it, it became popular enough so that there were a lot of uh, translators uh, applying from Europe and from all different parts of, of the world. And we didn't want to just have, you know, translators with 70 translated works each. So we, we tried to keep an eye out for emerging translators who were promising and so on, and to make a, a kind of an interesting um, a kind of a cocktail of, of, of translators who would be there for three weeks. The program is three weeks, which makes it quite different from the European uh, programs and some of the other ones in North America. In, in Europe alone, there's, I think, there's a, uh, there's a network called RECI, uh, which ha has um, uh, residency programs in a number of countries for, tra for literary translators. I think there are about 15 uh, participating residencies in that program. There's another one called HALWA, which has 30 or so in Europe. But often, it's basically for authors, but they accept some literary translators. But these programs are. You work on your own, by and large. Um, they're open all year, so it's not, you know, it's competitive, but not, it's highly competitive. It's the one at Banff, because it, at Banff it's only for three weeks. And the philosophy of the Vilsi program at Banff is to really encourage uh, dialogue among the translators. So instead of just, you know, leaving people to translate on their own, and, you know, everybody has their own carton of milk in the refrigerator with their name on it or something, you know, we, we really try to, we have three round tables a week. Uh, and at the round tables, you have the 15 translators, three student translators, uh, the directors of the program, and three consulting translators who come in uh, that the other translators can ask uh, you know, questions to or show their work to or whatever. So that's 28 people sitting around these big round tables. And they're really interesting because translators spend so much time working in solitude that on the whole, they really, they really appreciate uh, the, the, 
the opportunity at Banff to really exchange ideas, you know, uh, talk about what's happening in their country with translation, funding of translation, and so on. And um, uh, it's, it's really been quite a success. And of course, a lot of, a lot of the talk also takes place you know, over meals or over hiking in the forest or you know, <laughs> watching the bears or, you know, or a, Being eaten a, by a drink bear. here and there. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the BAMP Center also, um, uh, among the 15 translators, uh, the center makes funds available for, mm, say, six or seven authors to also be invited. All expenses paid, including airfare. And uh, so the author can work with the translator, and then the author can participate in these discussions as well. And so that, you know, that makes it even all the more interesting. And often there are author translators and translator authors. So it's really uh, the program. Uh, I worked in the program for four years, and uh, there's a new. Uh, uh, I, I uh, was a co director of it with Katie Silver, who lives in San Francisco. She did it on her own for a year, and now we're going to have a new uh, Mexican um, head of the program, Pedro Serrano. And uh, so. Uh, Katie's still on the advisory council and so on. So we're you know, looking forward to, the program has been quite a success and uh, we hope it continues to be in the future. Yeah, it's great for bringing translators together and, and with the authors. The year we were there, Joseph Boyden was there with, uh, with his Dutch translator and with his French translator. And there was very interesting d exchanges between discussing how they dealt with the problems and the, translating the book. So it's really a great for a cross fertilization between translators. And we could, you know, we've given talks and stuff at, at uh, Alta uh, for a while. We did every year uh, uh, on uh, uh, on the program. On the program, and you know, we really encourage any and everybody who wants to who wants to come to uh, to go there. And, um, one of the great things um, I was in Banff in 2010. Um, so was Lita. That's um, and one of the great things that you pointed out was that everybody's there at the same time, that everybody's there at the same time as opposed to other literary residencies where you're working by yourself. But the, the, the intensity and the concentration of um, everybody being there at the same time leads to great connections. And I, I think a few of you have been there and, and can speak to that. But um, you know, some of us have, have started collaborating um, or become editors or connecting to other op opportunities to be published, uh, whether it's in journals or uh, small presses. Um, so it's a very fruitful, dynamic program that is not only about um, the work that you're doing while you're there, but you can make lasting connections. Um, and speaking of the Mexico, the Mexican, uh, the new director, mm -hmm. Part of the part of what we're doing uh, with this pilot partnership between Alta and Eltec uh, is going to lead to in including ha not having like a parallel, including Mexico in bringing to this program that uh, every year providing programming for um, for the Alta conferences from Eltec will combine with bringing Mexico in as well to hopefully. Uh, every year have us, even if it's a small contingent of Mexican translators uh, that may or may not be associated with uh, BuildC as well. Um, but that's really exciting for me. Uh, and I hope, uh, I think there are some other Canadians in the, in the group. You know, there were supposed to be a couple of people here from University of Alberta, but I don't know who they yeah. are or if they are here. No. I think they, they're, they're actually doing another round table there themselves oh, okay. at, at the same time. Okay. Can, um, I, can I mention uh, some of the things that our, our association has, has tried to do yes. to get past this impasse um, you know, of, of being stuck between French and English? Some of the, we've gone constantly over the years the different presidents of our association have have tried to uh, have have tried to uh, get support from the Canada Council for for uh, translation uh, of, of other languages, uh, and and we think that there are very good reasons for that. Um, 
just just in terms of you were talking about rights, uh, Steve. Um, it's very hard, I think, for publishers. I hear from publishers that it's hard to buy uh, to um, when you're buying rights. It's a you know if you can sell rights at the same time, uh, it's things work work better. Um, so it so it would be uh, it would actually be beneficial if if there were uh, if uh, if Canadians could could be publishing more translations of uh, foreign authored works they would there would be a better opportunities to sell Canadian authored works so this is all kind of to say why it would be good for Canada um, but, but since that <coughs> seems to be a you know seems to be the the, the big uh, the selling point of it. Um, yes, that's uh, the criteria they're going to use. It's going to be harder to sell it because it's not seen as a as a national unity issue, and there have been no. I, I, I realize yeah. that, but I, I just yeah. want to give a few yeah. a few of the arguments that we've used. And yeah, sure. We haven't been successful, so um, yeah. you know, we've also said a few years ago, uh, uh, Robert Maisel's, uh, who's a Canadian writer and translator. Um, uh, uh, wrote a petition, created a petition that was circulated uh, in the uh, translators community saying that any, any translation that's published in Canada automatically contributes to Canadian culture. Yeah. Uh, this seems obvious to us as translators, but it's, uh, a, it's hard to get through, the, through to, a, to a bureaucrat. Um, well, that's part of the, our argument in running our series, that in fact we... Uh, choose differently just because of who we are yeah. and that uh, in fact it's important that translation come not only from London and New York but also from places like Windsor, Ontario and that that, that is a diversification of culture both on an international scale and within Canada. The it's you know that doesn't make it easy, but the and we have... No, I think it's very brave of you. <laughs> the, um, the, you know, I don't know if an American publisher would have chosen to do Black Bread, the, the Catalan novel we're doing. I know that several American publishers had turned down on Jockey, who has now become a big international star, because his first novel had a very positive portrayal of uh, Cubans in Angola. And it, even New Directions was scared off by it. And they sat on it for over a year and then decided no. And so just because uh, the Cuban thing was never such a bogeyman in Canada, it was a lot easier for us to do it. Um, Onjaki is one of the writers we publish. He's a young writer from Angola. He's in his late 30s. He's published about 20 books that have been translated into eight or nine languages. And one of, uh, he wrote a novel, what is probably the novel of his that's best known internationally is called Good Morning Comrades. And it's about the relationship between Angolan school children in the 1980s and their teachers who were Cubans. I translated it, yeah. <laughs> okay, this is, this, is, this is a very important topic. Okay, let's talk about distribution and rights. Most. Can I finish my list? I'm sorry. <laughs> he did warn us. I, 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 I thought it was done, sorry. I encouraged. No, those, I only gave you two reasons. Um, I, I also think it's really, I, I, when I've been at, at Biltsy and in other contexts, I've, I've really been impressed you know, I'm, I'm a typical Canadian. I'm sort of, uh, well, we're, we're okay. We're not that great, you know. But when, I'm, when we're with other international translators, I see that, you know, Canadian translators have developed amazing expertise, but mainly in between French and English. And, mm. and I, I really think it would be possible to just go that little step further and, uh, and develop expertise in other languages. And finally, you know, one of the, uh, my final argument, and boy, this one really didn't go over, was, <laughs> was I was saying, well, look, you know, uh, when you're, we translators are artists, and, you know, you give, <laughs> Don't you, tell them that. <laughs> you fund, uh, you, you know, you fund uh, musicians who are interpreting uh, uh, Beethoven. Well, you know, our translators, we interpret, you know, writers from other languages. Why are we not, you know, given that same that <laughs> same respect? Uh, and, and if you can think of any other arguments, 
I think that's a good one. That's, a, a, that's an ingenious one, I have to say. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I really, I'm, I'm marshalling all the arguments I can. And, and the, the problem is, you see, most... I don't think they're interested. Part of the problem is that most publishers uh, really don't like that idea because they basically feel they get... There's so little money given to them that they certainly don't want to share it, you know, beyond English and French translation. And I think... Okay, I mean, now I'm finished. Okay. <laughs> so English and French translators still are pretty privileged in the sense because they get paid 18 cents a word by the Canada Council. If you're translating from another language, you get whatever the, the country offers, right? So if... And this means it's a huge problem to publish a novel from somewhere like El Salvador because you're, there you've got a government that is not going to help you. If you're publishing a novel from Sweden, you're probably a lot better off. And, but, you know, I, sometimes you do get help from the host country, but the host country isn't that well off, so you will translate a 300-page novel and you'll get $1,000 or something from the host country, and that will be your payment. So there is, uh, whereas the, the Canada Council-funded trans translator doing a novel from French doing a 300-page novel will do quite well and get twelve or $15,000. And right? probably do better than the author, which is like you, a... Much yeah. better a than whole, the author. A whole much other better problem than the that author. You, kind of makes you... Yes. Alex. Uh, so I was wondering, maybe, you know, Lita, somebody on the panel is translating the French or English, can talk a little bit more about what that's like and what they want to see the same. And the other thing I was wondering about was, since this is a perennial topic for us Reviews. So, you know, we've talked about uh, uh, funding of translation, we've talked about publishing of translation, we've talked about the distribution. Um, how widely are translated works reviewed in the Canadian media? Uh, and when they are reviewed, you know, I mean, I, I'm on Twitter, so I see name the translator coming from Madeline as much as anybody else. <laughs> and I met her in Banff, by the way, two summers ago. So, um, yeah, I'd like to talk about that about and link it to that other question. Thank you for the question, Alex. But before I get to that, I just wanted to mention something very briefly about going back to Glenn and, and uh, what I find. Uh, sort of a significant difference between LTAC and ALTA is the lack of LTAC's presence within the university uh, environment. Um, uh, and it kind of leaves the field completely um, open to an institution like, uh, like ATIO that sort of monopolizes uh, and actively recruits uh, students, whereas LTAC could have more of a, an involved and engaged presence. Now, going back to um, the question that you had, it's not, I always think of it, um, uh, of course, being mostly famil familiar with the uh, Iranian uh, writers who uh, get published in Canada, uh, I think of those writers as being the, um, the hurdles in getting uh, works from uh, Iranian authors translated into English, but it's not a specifically Canadian problem. Um, what I think is uh, problematic is the uh, surge of memoirs and sort of uh, the, these highly uh, exoticized, uh, tokenized works that are getting published uh, both in the form of fiction or uh, non-fiction uh, that don't leave much room for work to be translated from... Re reading Lolita in Tehran? <laughs> uh, no, we have a Canadian version of it, yeah. Prisoner of Tehran. Oh, yes, I remember and that. And a sequel yes. to it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also a work, uh, <laughs> a work of uh, a collection of short stories that interestingly is titled Echoes from the Other Land. I'm not, by the way, I'm not passing any critical judgment on the content of those, but um, maybe I am. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did I just Go ahead, be <laughs> critical. Too obvious. Um, but uh, I think, um, uh, and in the case of those uh, few authors who are trying not to fall into those pitfalls, 
they uh, end up self-translating and presenting the work as a work as an original work that is written in English, um, as opposed to marketing it as a translation. Um, and as I said, it's not a specifically Canadian problem, but it's something I have been um, in close contact with. Um, Could you yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you speak about your translations? Because you translate from Portuguese, and you had your recent volume uh, published. Yeah, that was with uh, Wolsack and Wynn, and they <coughs> they put up the. They they also did an Argentine uh, translation that I did before, and, and they were just interested in it. I was actually commissioned to find a young emerging Latin American uh, woman writer to translate, who hadn't been published before, mm -hmm. and so uh, you can feel this. You know, you can feel that the the momentum is there now. There. there you know, uh, what you're doing at Bibli Oasis and so on. I mean, uh, there's a feeling that Canadian publishing has to, you know, really start uh, publishing authors from abroad. Uh, to the point that Wolf Second Win, a small publisher, is willing to put up their own money to publish the book. No, uh, there were no uh, subventions uh, involved. Um, McGill Queen's Press. Uh, uh, the, one thing that I found has been interesting in the last few years is there's some books that have been overlooked in by uh, British, American, and French publishers um, for some reason. Uh, classics that have been overlooked. And uh, several Canadian publishers have taken advantage of that and, and actually published these books and put uh, a fair amount of money uh, into buying the rights and so on. One of them was uh, Adan Buenos Aires, which is an 800 page novel by Leopardo. Uh, uh, Marichal, uh, translated by Norman Cheadle, who lives in uh, Sudbury, and uh, he devoted years and years to translating this thing, and he did a great job. And uh, fortunately, it was uh, Mark Avely was the literary agent at uh, at McGill Queens, and when he, he saw the manuscript, he said, "Well, this thing is fantastic." And it hadn't received; it, it's considered a classic in Latin America, but it hadn't received the recognition internationally that. Uh, that it really should have, uh, partially because uh, Marichal had kind of been, <coughs> been more open to the Peronis than Borges would have liked. So there were some buttons that were turned off in the reception uh, yeah. area for uh, this novel. And now it's considered a classic. McGill Queen said they would go ahead with it. Uh, Marichal's daughter, who is in her 80s now, was, um, was thrilled. And asked for uh, you know for McGill Queens a pretty hefty uh, payment for the rights, and they said okay if they wanted to go through with it, because it, 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 they saw it as kind of important that that uh, a Canadian publisher should be bringing out this classic. The same thing happened on the French side with um, Ortiz's uh, Contrapunteo de Contrapunteo de uh, Tabaco y Azúcar, which oh, is really? a sociological cl uh, classic. Oh yeah, yeah, and there's I know. A, that. There's a Haitian publisher who has his own publishing company now. He publishes Haitian, immigrant, First Nations, in other words, indigenous writers. Uh, uh, Rodney saint eloi it's called Mémoire d'en Crier. He has over 100 titles now. And he saw this thing and he said, that was never translated in, in, in France. And it's a classic of yeah. Latin American sociology. It was brought out in the, in the 1930s, I think. And so he, he paid for it out of his own out of his own pocket. He got a few euros uh, from, because the, the translator was from uh, France and so on, so he got a few euros here, got a few Canadian dollars there, put the whole thing together. And so that's another classic now that uh, was published uh, in Canada. So there's, there are various kinds of um, strategies going, going on to, to uh, bring out works uh, from, uh, from other countries. Hugh has... Uh, um Claire Barret published uh, French translations of uh, uh, Le Spectre. Of? Le Spectre. Claire Richard Le Spectre. French translations of Claire Richard uh, Yeah, has Claire Varin published uh, those? Uh, I don't think so because the French translations were done by other people. Do we have a, okay. a, a okay. woman in, in, in Montreal who's an international specialist in uh, Clarice Le Spectre and has published several books uh, about her writing? Um, but I don't think her translations okay, have been... Okay, I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, no, I think okay. the, the French got to that before, before we could. 
the, there was a question earlier about rights and there was a question about reviews and I, I wanted to answer the question about rights which I haven't been able to do so far so I'd, I'd like to tie it in with the reviews because the two are are somewhat related um, there getting reviewed is of course increasingly difficult for any book but it's really really difficult for translations one thing we just I think we have had a total of one or two reviews for all the international translations we have published in Canada. Yes, yes, and one of them, our uh, the publisher literally phoned up the book page editor and said, you know, you idiot, <laughs> and then took him out for a drink, and it took about three drinks, I think, before we finally got the review. But there, we have had literally, there, most of our best known, best known authors have not been reviewed um, in Canada. The and this turn leads to rights. So if we because if we were depending strictly on the Canadian market, the books would sink. The rights in general in Canada are done obviously on a country by country basis. So if a Canadian publisher publishes a novel that does well in Canada, one of the first things they try to do is sell U.S. rights to a U.S. publisher. Uh, Biblioasis is, ha has a very much a border mentality. It is in Windsor, Ontario. It's a 25-minute walk from the front door of the office to downtown Detroit. Um, and they are the only Canadian publisher that I'm aware of which does not recognize the United States as a separate territory. So when they buy rights to Canadian novels, they will never sell, no matter how successful they become in Canada, they will never sell U.S. rights to a U.S. publisher. They do the marketing in the States themselves directly. And this, has, this is controversial. Um, there are some aspects of it I'm not very comfortable with, but it has allowed the translation series to survive. And because we have been able to sell the translations in the States, and I would argue we've actually had some influence in selling the translations in the States. The obvious example is Mia Cotto, the Mozambican writer, whose fiction had been published by Serpent's Tale in London. Um, and when we published his novel, uh, Jesus Sané, which was published as The Tuner of Silences, it, was, it actually got a lot of press in the States. And I would argue it was instrumental in him getting the, the Neustadt Prize in 2014. Mm -hmm. But when we brought him to Toronto, I couldn't get the the book review editors of either of the two of any of the three major Toronto newspapers to come to his reading. I couldn't get the there were his reading was packed with 300 Portuguese immigrants, all of whom had lived in Mozambique or Angola or, or Cape Verde at some point. Um, but the but nobody significant from the literary community came to his reading. And you know this is somebody who's a potential future Nobel Prize winner. And it's the first time he's ever been in Toronto, and we did tons of publicity. And, no, and so the Canadian literary media is very much attuned to two things. One is they know there are certain Canadian books they have to review, and then they pick what are the big international things they have to review, the Franzens and the Murakamis, and that's what they review. They're not interested in the fact that a press in Southern Ontario has published somebody who might win a Nobel Prize in 15 years. But when he does... When he does, they'll say, oh, we knew all about it all along, yes. Would you be more likely to review that book if it were published by U.S. Marginally. Marginally. The... Um, but maybe... Yeah, I don't know. Probably not terribly likely, but it would have a slightly better chance would be my guess. But the, the, the fact of actually marketing the books directly in the States has made the series somewhat viable. We still lose money on every non-Quebec translation. Not a single one has broken even yet. Uh, but, the, but over 75% of our sales are in the States for the non-Quebec translations. I'm, I, they're, they're the only ones that don't recognize the U.S. as a separate territory, which I th and I think that is true. The um, so most of most uh, there are other publishers who no Canadian publishers can sign on with a U.S. distributor, and some of the smaller ones do that. I mean, we're not the only Canadians who are with the consortium, which is who we're with. 
there are other Canadians who are there. But most of the Canadian publishers who are with consortium, if they have a book that starts to take off, they will try to sell U.S. rights to a U.S. publisher. And Biblioasis does not do that. That's what I'm saying. Okay, because, uh, and I, I know of Coach House? Yes, Coach House, for example, I think is with consortium. Okay, and they just... But they, they have also tried to sell U.S. rights to books that have done well. One, one really interesting thing that, that happened a, a few years ago is uh, uh, Patsy Aldana, who, uh, she worked with a, a children's publisher called Groundwood Press, and um, she developed uh, Tigrillo books. So at one point she asked me to, if I would do a translation of a kind of an anthology with beautiful illustrations of folk tales from different parts of Latin America. And I looked at the, and she had put together this anthology. She was uh, 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 born in Guatemala herself. And uh, I, I noticed that the Groundwood books always seem to be doing really well. And anyway, she, she said, uh, yeah, and oh, by the way, could you use American spellings? You know? I said, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah. it turns out that With the children's book, books, they she do did, it, yeah. She did an incredible job. She brought out the most beautiful books. Huge. She had a, a, a thing of, on the uh, version of Guadalupe with incredible pop-outs. I had the most like <laughs> elaborate Baroque pop-outs I'd ever seen with like 32 pieces that would pop out and stuff and then you'd fold them back in. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, I, you know, I would say they, just offhand, that they had, they had maybe 50, 60 books published, uh, some bilingual, and they were mainly targeted the for market. the U.S. Mm -hmm. Hispanic market. Right. And um, they sold in the tens of thousands in, in the U.S. And you could see a lot of them were actually by uh, Mexican-American authors. Um, it was really uh, quite extraordinarily, uh, quite extraordinary what she, what she achieved. Um, um, it's worth saying that what happens in children's publishing is not what happens in right. adult literary publishing. Yeah, it's another though. world. Yeah, it's another yes, world. right, yeah. So, um, but very savvy. Since we have um, only a few minutes left, I, I just wanted to <laughs> make a comment on um, how it seems to me that there, there's enough momentum and there's enough, there are enough opportunities that are opening up uh, to increase or to break out of that English-French mold. And I wanted to know if, if any of you had any closing comments for uh, any, whether it's new opportunities to do this or strengthening and continuing all the established um, programs. I mean, Bill C is hopefully going to continue, but in terms of publications or collaborations between uh, whether it's LTAC and other organizations or uh, such as the uh, Translate uh, publication, uh, that pu their last, their most recent issue had eight different languages, uh, uh, eight different lang language combinations, um, or with educational programs in translation, um, just to I would say it's something that should come naturally to us because we're a country of a lot of recent immigrants. You know, there are 52 percent of the population of Toronto was not born in Canada, and another 30 to 40 percent. This is a city of six million people with 52 percent not born in the country, and another 30 to 40 percent are the children of immigrants. So a lot of these people have expertise, or at least as a conversant, in languages that are not English or French. So we should have a, a, an ability to move into this area, and uh, par and. Into and publishing in, in, into tra well, we should have be able to develop translators from languages other than French, uh, because a lot of people in Canada grow up with languages other than French or English as their home languages, um, and we have we actually do have a in the mandate we've given ourselves we ha in the series I edit we what part of our mandate is to look for books in non-official languages of Canada. And one of our, the first book, the third book we did was uh, written in an archaic Austrian German in Rockwood, Ontario. And it was uh, by a, a man who was a retired professor of German at the University of Toronto who had fled Vienna from the Nazis in 1939. And he wrote this book in his retirement. It was published by a small press in Vienna, got superb reviews, and then came out as a mass market paperback in Germany with Rovolt, and, which is a large German paperback publishing company. And we, that was one of our first ones. So we are, I think it should be a natural part of our programs to publish not just from abroad, but also from, you know, German, Spanish, Inuktitut, whatever's out there. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and in, in, in terms of Hispanic writers of Canada, I mean, it, that that uh, that uh, subsidy for uh, writers from third languages who are translating into English and French on the part of the Canada Council, that was absolutely crucial. Yeah. And, and, and so now there's been a lot of stuff published by uh, Latin American writers of, uh, who write in Spanish uh, in, in Canada, Canada. Uh, paid for by the Canada Council and everything. And that's had, uh, that's had a, a, a large impact. And uh, in translation programs in universities, now as Spanish is starting to come in, uh, maybe not, it's not part of the translation programs. They're still English French, French English. But it's linked from the uh, from the uh, uh, modern languages program. So, uh, you know, there is an increasing awareness, uh, you know, that the time has come to uh, to move out uh, beyond. But Canada has really established a strong uh, center uh, for of translation between English and French. It's great what it's done, but it's time to to broaden that out uh, into other spheres. And obviously, we couldn't have done. Um, the Khan and Engelman, the, the novel we published without Canada Council support. It's a 400 page novel, it's very complicated. It, uh, we needed a very good professional translator. It's full of Yiddish puns and Hungarian slang and a, a German that nobody has spoken since 1945 and so on. So, the, um, we, so we, we, we wouldn't have been able to do it had we not received third, third language funding, but it's st that's still a tiny, tiny proportion. Our translator was a a German, a hyperactive German professor who works 24 hours a day, and she publishes articles and she translates books and. And did she bring the book to you? No, no. I I, I happen to know this gentleman. Okay. He brought the book to me. Now he he didn't tell us actually that we had to buy rights from it. He told us he had, that he had the rights. Oh. And after it came out, we got a very angry letter from Vienna, but <laughs> saying you didn't buy the rights from us. But anyway. <laughs> no, it isn't, I'm afraid. It's a, it, is, it is a great book, though. Any, any <laughs> last uh, quick questions? You've been asking questions all along. So yeah, I yeah it's good. That. Okay. <laughs> we, had a, we had a Czech writer, too, in the 1960s, Skorvecki. Skorvecki, oh, oh, my great buddy Skorvecki, yes. From, uh, it was yeah. uh, in Toronto, and he kept writing in Czech, and his stuff was translated into English, uh, you know. Sure. And, uh, oh, and so that was yeah. also uh, another. Uh, the other thing is that the, the Canada Council sets 18 cents for, for uh, fiction, 20 for theater, 25 for poetry. Uh, per word, Thank so big bucks. Uh, from language. Uh, well, generally English, it French, French, English, into, or from the third English languages, third languages, into English and French. If the Canada, author, if the author right? is Canadian, if, if the, the author is Canadian. Canadian. In France, the rates vary uh, according to the language, so there are languages that you translate from that are considered more difficult. To <laughs> this is really odd. <laughs> <laughs> But, they, but the good thing, in, the good thing in Canada is that, that that those rates are usually quoted by, you know, in general. That becomes like the general uh, kind of touchstone for rates. So that helps. It's also supposed well, to be a minimum rate. Right? That's that's what the yes, Canada and that's a minimum. Is. Good point. Publishers can give can Should can, more. can add more, and and they, but they don't. don't. <laughs> well, you can sometimes well, yeah. negotiate it. Yeah, well, yeah. Tiny little royalty, yeah. just to, just for just for the principle of it. <laughs> well, we could be here for a lot longer. <laughs> Thank you all for. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot.